All right, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Linda Faulkner. She's a Deputy uh, Director of the Challenge Māori, and um, she's very kindly uh, offered to give an introduction and karakia uh, to today's webinar. So, hand it over to you, Linda. Kia ora, Conrad. O tēnā rā koutou katoa, nau mai oki mai anō, kia tātou nei wā i kōrero i raro i te maru o hene kauoro ia, e kōrero o ai tikanga, te au o te moana. Anō reira koutou mā, rangatira mā, nei rā te mei mai o ai kia tātou. Me tī mata mātou i karakia kia waka wāti ai a tātou nei kōrero. Uh, e wātoro ana te ngā kai ki a rātou o te wā ingaro. Kia tau mai nei te manaakitanga ki runga ki tēnei oi oinga. Tā warautia mātou i te kāka uta ki take o te manātua o te manāreke. Tūturu kia rongo waka māua kia tēna, tēna. Oi e tai ki e. Welcome everybody. Um, just to um, support Conrad's words of welcome for joining the session um, this morning, this third webinar in the, in the Te Au o Te Moana series by Sustainable Seas. Uh, te Au o Te Moana, the voice of the ocean. Um, I was reminded this morning of um, a whakatauki or proverb in the uh, Ruruku Whakatupua uh, Wanganu River Claim Settlement Act, which goes something like kaua e kōrero mō te awa, me kōrero ki te awa. Uh, don't merely speak of the river, but speak instead with the river. Um, and this is relevant to Te Oote Moana or the voice of the ocean in that it's about relating to the moana and seeking its guidance as well as bringing ours to bear. So with that, I will hand back over to Conrad and um, hope you all enjoy the presentation this morning. Kia ora koutou. Linda, thank you for the lovely introduction and the karakia to uh, set us on our way today. So welcome everybody to our webinar on healthy seas. Um, today's webinar, we're going to be highlighting some of the research the challenge has been doing um, on cumulative effects. And um, we're going to set up the webinar today. We've got a, a series of speakers um, followed uh, by an expert panel discussion at the end of it. So please, if you have questions um, as we're going along that you'd like the panelists to address, um, please enter your questions in the Q&A and you can find that um, down at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to that during the panel session. So healthy seas is something we can all relate to and, and a healthy sea obviously will sustain healthy people both spiritually, culturally and economically and hopefully intergenerationally. One of the most amazing experiences of being involved with this challenge over the last several years has been the opportunity to uh, move around the motu and, and talk with people, talk with hapu and iwi at a community level, talk with those trying to manage our oceans and regional and central government. And the overriding message from a lot of these conversations is that the moana is not in a great state in many places. And in fact, many people have documented um, declines, not only uh, in their lifetimes, but in talking to Tangata Whenua, the intergenerational um, loss, uh, sense of loss that's occurring in our coastal environments. And as many of you will be aware, this loss or this change in ecosystem state has been recorded and reported in multiple government reports. Now this decline is, is multifaceted, is multifaceted, and a lot of it has to do with the cumulative effects that our oceans are experiencing. We know on land that we're increasing our intensification of agriculture, we're changing land use patterns. New Zealand's unique situation in the westerly uh, wind belt, our high mountainous and easily erodible soils generates a lot of sediments into our coastal environment. And also our cities and urban areas are expanding rapidly, which introduces its own sorts of contamination. And all of these are impacting on the coastal ocean. We also have stresses within the ocean. We're increasing in our aquaculture. We have a large and vibrant fishing industry. There's also me, uh, marina and port developments occurring in many of our estuaries. And we have point uh, disasters such as the Rena oil spill. Now the ocean's capacity to dilute and disperse is clearly being tested. And these stresses overlap in time and space and create unintended consequences. Understand, understanding the footprints of these stresses and how they interact with other stresses has been a key focus of the challenge. And we've also got ongoing within this environment, the global context of a more warming and more acidified world. So clearly this is a very difficult problem to understand. And one, although we've recognized that cumulative effects are important, actually making traction in the marine environment and moving forward on their management, hopefully recovery is one of the key challenges for this for our challenge. <clears throat> 
in many areas, we in the first phase of the challenge, we were documenting a lot on uh, researching a lot on the ecological consequences of rapid or abrupt changes or tipping points, and what were the triggers that would lead to degraded states within our marine environment. This work was really important in forming our ecological understanding of how these stresses impact the ecosystem. There is no way in my lifetime or in multiple people's lifetimes we could look at all the possible um, stressor interactions and come up with a model of how they're going to out, uh, play out in many of our ecosystems, but we can understand the ecological consequences of some of them. In phase two, we've been moving more to looking about how we can think about managing these stresses for recovery in our moana. And today's webinar is going to be covering a lot of these different concepts and also the consequences for decision making. So in this webinar, I've said we've assembled um, some really great research uh, researchers within the challenge that have been working in these key areas. We have uh, leading off today, we have Megan Anapana, who's a, a PhD student in uh, Tangaroa project that Kurapu work leads, Afi Mai Afiatu. Megan's PhD research is a model of how co-development research is, should and can be done within Aotearoa New Zealand. She's working with iwi and hapu to address degradation in Ohiwa Harbour and bringing together the best of Mataranga and west of Western science to come up with practical solutions on the ground for recovery. Rebecca Gladstone Gallagher is a research fellow at the University of Auckland, working across several projects in the challenge, but today she's going to be talking a little bit about our ecological understanding of the nature of change and what are the bottlenecks to recovery and highlight the ecological principles that should govern our strategy to managing stresses and managing for recovery. Simon Thrush is the leader of 1.1, a professor of marine sciences at the University of Auckland, and he's going to be bringing that ecological thinking and how that can underpin management frameworks and strategy and how we can use that to make better decisions around stress and management. The final two talks are going to be talking about some of the frameworks and tools we've actually been developing to aid decision making. Joanne Alice is at the University of Waikato. She leads um, 3.2 Communicating Risk and Uncertainty. And she'll be looking at how these, how our ecological understanding of degradation, the changes that occur, and bringing those into risk and uncertainty frameworks for management decisions. And finally, we have Tom Bro, who's a key researcher in 1.2, which is developing spatially explicit tools for cumulative effects management, and one tool to help uh, managers on the ground think about how cumulative effects can be brought into these spatial tools in order to aid decision making. So we have a fabulous group of speakers. Each speaker will talk for approximately 10 minutes. And then, as I said, we'll be turning it over to an expert panel following their talks um, to uh, bring um, this all to a head at the end of the webinar today. So I'm going to turn it over uh, now to, um, to Megan um, to lead us off for the first talk. Thanks, Megan. Uh, ngā mihi nui e te rangatira a Conrad, uh, ka nui te mihi ki a koutou nō ngā te awa me Waikato Tainui e hau, uh, ko Megan Lana Pia Tōku Ingwa. Uh, thank you Conrad for your introduction. Kia ora everyone, my name is Megan and I am a PhD student at the University of Waikato uh, and I'm here to present the perspective of degradation and recovery of the moana by hapu and iwi. Next slide please. Uh, so my presentation will be focusing on how we are working towards a healthy ocean through co-developing with e our iwi partners, using the example of the starfish outbreak in Ohiwa Harbour. Uh, as Conrad mentioned, this research sits within a wider sustainable seas project called Afi Mai Afi Atu, Kaitiakitanga based uh, approach to ecosystem based management. Just as a disclaimer, when talking about degradation and recovery from an iwi and hapu perspective, I'm predominantly talking from the experiences we have with our iwi partners. So how other iwi and hapu or Māori view and respond to degradation of their moana will be different, although I'm sure there's uh, some similarities. Next slide, please. So co-development for this research refers to collectively working with our iwi partners based on their aspirations, their issues, their needs and their priorities for their harbour. This does mean sharing control of the research objectives, practices, dissemination, and outcomes. Here you can see in this slide, we have somewhat of a circular co-development framework that has both Mā Tauranga Māori and science uh, feeding into it. And underpinning this framework is 
these key kaupapa Māori principles um, that have been outlined by Te Awe Kōtuku in 1991. And these principles are a way for uh, researchers who are wanting to engage uh, in these sort of spaces um, done in sort of a way and that's really much a tikanga Māori approach. Uh, and so I'll be talking through these sort of different stages as we continue. Next slide, please. Uh, so stage one is recognising and employing uh, irrelevant stakeholders, or in our case, iwi advisors, researchers, community and council members. Um, so I can't really speak to this uh, because this ropu, this group, was really founded a long time before I came along. Uh, but what I can speak to is that co-development does start with having good relationships, which is what we have. Uh, and this is testament to my supervisor who has nurtured a strong relationship for over 10 years. Uh, and this is a key principle in te ao Māori known as whakawhanaungatanga. However, this does require more tension, time and effort than is often acknowledged in research, but should be considered um, and built into research methodologies. And this image here is actually uh, uh, our, our collective group known as the Rōpū Kairangahau, uh, and they are essentially our Mātauranga Māori uh, advisory group. So for me, it's about seeking knowledge and advice from our kaumātua, our Rōpū Kairangahau, that really guides and informs the work I do for my PhD. Next slide, please. Um, so the next stage is uh, developing research questions. So the research questions for us, or well, the research questions being asked need to reflect the voices of our iwi partners and Māori communities, uh, who, or whoever the end user uh, really is. So some of the big questions that have come out of previous work is why there's so many sea stars uh, in Ohiwa Harbour, and two, how do we best manage them to encourage recovery of the muscle beds? But my research is predominantly focused on question two. And so to understand how these questions came about, I want to give a brief background about Ohiwa Harbour. Uh, next slide, please. So Ohiwa Harbour is uh, located in the Eastern Bay of Pliny. It's a mahinga kai, so a traditional food gathering place for several iwi, including Ngātiawa, Tu Pokorehe, Whakatohia, and Tuhoi. With the harvesting of kaimuana and occupation of the harbour comes a wealth of mātauranga a iwi, or place-based intergenerational knowledge. And from this knowledge, local iwi were able to detect and respond early to the decline of their traditional muscle beds. So what they did was establish a rahui and employed an iwi-led monitoring program. From this monitoring program, they were able to identify potential drivers of the muscle bed decline, which included the overabundant 11-armed starfish, which you can see in this image here. Now these sea stars are natural predators to the mussels, but in large numbers can have devastating effects. So in response, they actually set up a muscle restoration program that was successful in recruiting and growing mussels on natural resource lines. But the next stage is to seed or put these um, mussels back on the sea floor. However, their concerns is that the starfish will hinder uh, recovery. Next slide, please. So then we wanted to um, implement, uh, or yeah, basically implement uh, these research questions. So we came up with a research program or study design that works towards answering those questions. So the first thing we wanted to do was collect empirical information that supported iwi concerns, as well as help determine the next stages of the research. So essentially what we just did was record current sea star and muscle distribution, abundance and population dynamics. And this helped us get a better picture of what's happening under the water and informed us if sea stars are still recruiting to the harbour. Next slide, please. Uh, and then what we wanted to do, or what we did, was disseminate our findings to the Rōpū Kairangahau. Uh, it was important that we uh, presented it in a way and used the language in a way that they could interpret and then respond to um, the data. So we conducted a hui, shared our findings and sought their opinions and advice and based the next phase of the research on their feedback. This is essentially how we co-develop um, our research at every level and every stage with our kaumātua. What we found was yes, both sea stars and mussels showed signs of recruitment. Starfish distribution is uh, highly associated with mussels with the exception of one muscle bed in the harbour mouth. 
Uh, and so it is likely that sea stars will continue placing predation pressures on the mussels. Next slide, please. So with this new set of information came a new set of research questions that we wanted to answer. And so we've kind of come full circle. And now we all agreed that investing in research around sea star intervention by removal was the best approach. So we came up with these sort of uh, three questions. One, is it feasible to remove sea stars? Two, would removing sea stars actually improve muscle recovery? Or are there some other underlying factors that's driving their decline? And three, sitting parallel to this project is actually a habitat suitability model that has been developed by NEWA scientists. Uh, and then we're potentially going to use that to explore or identify uh, these sort of refuge sites from sea star predation. Uh, next slide, please. So with those questions, we then um, developed and executed an ex well, a yet to execute an experimental study. So we've proposed three uh, starfish removal treatments, one by trapping, another one by diver removal, and then our control treatments. And then once we've done that, we're going to seed or plant mussels in these uh, locations and uh, just monitor their survival rates. Following from this experiment, we'll also uh, replicate the control treatments throughout the harbour using the habitat suitability model. Uh, and what this will do was one, help ground truth the model, and two, potentially locate uh, areas that act as refuge sites from sea star predation. Uh, next slide, please. And so with all this information, we're going to report back our findings to the Rōpū Kairangaho and then collectively work together on recommendations for sea star management for Ohiwa Harbour. Kia ora. Kia ora, Megan. Thanks so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, Rebecca is our next speaker. Kia ora tato, ko Rebecca Gladstone Gallagher, toko ingoa. Um, my talk is about the nature of change in coastal ecosystems, and I'm going to be summarising some of the ecological research that our team has done as part of Sustainable Seas that can inform uh, decision frameworks to manage coastal ecosystems for resilience and recovery. Next slide, please, Conrad. The coastal marine environment, as Conrad alluded to, is subjected to multiple stresses originating both on land and in the sea. Um, but the problem is, is that a combination of often seemingly quite small problems can lead to large ecological shifts from uh, healthy functioning ecosystems like this top photo here of an estuary to a degraded and non-desirable ecosystem like this muddy, muddier ecosystem below. And we call the combined uh, effect of multiple things cumulative effects. And these can lead to unpredictable changes that we call tipping points. Um, tipping points and cumulative effects complicate environmental management because they're difficult to predict before they happen. Next slide, please, Conrad. So there's countless stresses in the marine environment, and these all have multiple types of effects, both direct and indirect. So there are stresses that can be pollutants that alter processes, so things like nutrients and suspended sediment, these alter processes um, such as biogeochemical uh, cycles. There's also stresses that can be pollutants that are toxic, so things like heavy metals. Um, there can be stresses that remove structure from the ecosystem, and these are um, created by physical disturbances, or there are uh, disturbances that can remove species biomass from the food web. There's also stresses that add things like invasive species or diseases um, and parasites. And the key message here is that there are a lot of stresses which have a lot of different effects, and this makes managing environmental degradation pretty complex. So instead of putting limits on things individually, we need to draw on our understanding of how the ecosystem works to help us make decisions that are informed by ecology that builds the resilience of these um, ecosystem interaction networks. Next slide, please, Conrad. So I'm just going to go through some of the um, key stressor effects that we that we have been researching and we know of. So land-based pollutants can be toxic, but they can also affect processes, which means that setting limits on their concentrations uh, provides us with limited opportunity to prevent ecological damage. Um, and this is because the effects on processes are highly context dependent, depending on where you are and when you are. Um, and these effects might not be related to the concentration of the contaminant that comes in at the river mouth, for example. 
So for example, sediment runoff can increase water column turbidity in some situations. This can block light to the seabed, um, which alters processes and the resilience of the system. Um, but sediment can also accumulate in some estuaries and this accumulation modifies the estuary. Um, it increases the mud content, which alters things like nutrient cycling, it alters species compositions, and it effectively alters the whole ecosystem. Um, but this mud can stick around for a long time, even after the sediment stops coming in, which complicates environmental limit setting for the stressor. Um, but then there's also nutrients, which are another land-based pollution that can lead to significant uh, change in coastal systems. And high concentrations nutrients are toxic, but they also affect ecological processes and they stimulate things like algal blooms, like in this picture here. The problem is, is that some ecosystems can tolerate more nutrients than others, um, and these responses are highly context dependent, making them very difficult to manage. Um, next slide, please, Conrad. Our research on sediments over the years has demonstrated that ecological responses are not as simple as, as dose response relationships, and there's instead multiple tipping points or ecological transitions that occur uh, due to different types of effects of these stresses at different um, type stages of degradation. So we know that around 3% mud, there are effects of um, sediment on the sediment permeability and uh, the animals that live in the, on the seafloor change their behavior um, and, and this alters ecological processes. But after about 3% mud, there's a change in the system due to biogeochemical changes that come with um, this kind of layer of mud on the surface. Then after about 10 to 15% mud, there's several shifts that occur in community composition of organisms. But the key point here is that there are multiple tipping points and these are not associated with the amount of sediment that comes in at the river. They're associated with how that sediment accumulates in the coastal ecosystem and how it affects the ecology. And, and understanding this can inform us of, of how we might um, manage these kinds of effects. Next slide, please, Conrad. So I've talked about the effects of these land-based pollutants, but what happens when things occur together? Um, and this, this complicates the picture a little bit, but understanding how the ecosystem operates can inform us about how the ecosystem is likely to respond when we have multiple stressor situations. Um, this is an interaction network that's built based on decades of ecological research from members of our team and from others. Um, and the key thing to note here is that there's a lot of connections between species like shellfish in the pink boxes there. Um, connected to things like microbially mediated processes like primary production and nutrient cycling, um, and then also connections with environmental properties like sediment characteristics. And this means that when stress influences some of these components, there can be indirect effects on other components and these indirect effects and the structure of the network can influence how the ecosystem responds to additional stress. So, in this example here, we have a network in a clear estuary and a network in a turbid estuary that is impacted by sediment runoff. Um, and in the stress network that's impacted by turbidity, uh, there's a lot less connections and this makes it more vulnerable to other stresses like, uh, for example, nutrient input. Because when we uh, impact the network with one stressor, it decouples some of the processes that are important for providing resilience to the ecosystem. Um, in the case of nutrient input, for example. So we can see here that when we get multiple stresses, the interactions can be quite complex. So think about what this might look like if we had 10 stresses impacting this network. It all becomes quite um, complicated. Next slide, please, Conrad. Some stresses uh, remove structure or they remove species that balance the food web. Um, and this alters the entire ecosystem interaction network. So on the sea floor, fishing disturbance or um, mining, for example, can remove structure from the seabed. And, and this structure is provided by the animals that live on the sediment, things like sponges, shellfish, corals. This structure is the foundation of the ecosystem, and it's often at the heart of those ecosystem interaction networks that I showed you earlier. Um, in coastal rocky reefs, fishing also has large ecological effects because these are associated with the removal of um, predators by fishing. Um, this creates trophic cascades. And many of you will be familiar with the concept of urchin barrens where predator removal from fishing has resulted in a reduction in the pressure uh, on urchins, which are the prey. Um, and the urchins then decimate kelps, which is the dominant structuring organism in these subtidal rocky reefs. 
but research has been showing that the transitions between kelp forests and urchin barrens are different in different places. And so there are likely interactions between fishing and other stresses, for example, sediments. Next slide, please, Conrad. The problem is, is that when stresses, uh, stressor effects impact slow growing species um, or food webs, they leave, or they if they leave physical legacies behind like that example of sediment legacies and estuaries, um, recovery of the ecosystem can be quite, uh, quite, quite difficult to, to predict. And recovery is not always constant through time like population dynamic models sometimes predict. Um, instead, there's several ecological dynamics that can slow or block recovery. And in the case of sediments or other land-based pollutants, these kind of physical legacies that are left behind in the ecosystem can mean that even if we turned the sediment tap off in the catchment, recovery can be prevented because the sediment still remains in the ecosystem and so it can take decades before the sediment can be removed and things to start to recover. In the case of stresses that have removed slow growing species, we can get recovery lags because the species can just simply take years to grow back um, and some species are needed for other species to grow on top of them. Um, and so this means that even if the stress is removed, the ecosystem can have significant lags in recovery while we wait for um, those slow growing foundational species to come back um, if, they, if they can come back at all. And we get uh, different types of recovery trajectories that um, go, go with this, for example, uh, bottlenecks in recovery. In cases like urchin barrens, often removing the fishing pressure alone is not um, enough to flip the ecosystem back to its former kelp dominated state because the recovery of kelp may be hindered by stresses like climate change um, or sedimentation. And so these kind of hysteresis recovery lags can occur. So our research team has been looking at all these different recovery trajectories and how they can inform decisions for protecting and managing ecosystem degradation for degradation and recovery. Um, and we need to focus on which re recovery trajectories are most likely in certain circumstances to help guide decisions. Next slide, please, Conrad. So I'll just end with um, this kind of key message. The list of stresses in coastal ecosystems and the multitude of ways that they can impact ecosystems is massive. And there's no way of knowing exactly how different stressor combinations will all accumulate together when we have situations where we've got, um, where we've got massive amounts of different types of things happening. But we can't let this fact paralyze us. Uh, we need to develop frameworks that focus on the fact that we should expect that different things happen in different places. And we need to focus on what we do know about the ecology of different places to help us make wise decisions that are likely to be robust decisions that can halt further decline and promote recovery in a range of situations and contexts, including future ones like those under the influence of climate change, um, which are likely to shift the limits of resilience of our systems. So here I've talked about some of the ecology we've done that helps informs, inform how cumulative effects propagate through systems and um, now Simon's going to talk about some of the frameworks for um, environmental decision making. Got it. Thanks Rebecca. Simon. Thanks Conrad. Kira Kato, ko Simon Thrush, Toko Ina. I um, have been asked to talk about how we use this ecological knowledge within the context of uh, providing opportunities for EBM policy and practice. This is quite an important topic because um, I'm often trying to uh, push away from some of our current practices because they clearly aren't working very well. Next slide, please, Conrad. I want to start by talking about a, a slide that derives from a workshop that we ran in the first part of the challenge. This was a collaboration uh, mainly between sustainable seas and biological heritage, where we've been working on tipping points and ecological resilience. And we wanted to learn a little bit from each other about um, what we shared in common and what was different. The message really that, that comes from that is that the connections between these habitats are really important. And from our perspective um, at the bottom of the hill, it's important that we remember the water flows downhill, so we accumulate um, a lot of mess that derives from activities on the land and in freshwater ecosystems. Our marine systems are often the most sensitive um, and 
are massively valuable in terms of what they provide for us. And of course, we've got uh, plenty of activities going on within those systems that also add further to that mess. So we really do need to be framing up our management questions around these cumulative effects. So in this talk, I wanna talk really about um, how we can use the ecology to help us cut through um, the mess. And I want to focus on valuing nature, a shift to a restorative focus on the part of all of us and the power of democratizing science. Next slide, please, Conrad. So talking about the interface between science and policy really um, requires that I acknowledge the difficulties that, that we all have with ocean governance. This is a global problem. It's not just New Zealand's problem, but, but certainly it's a major issue for us. We have problems associated with fragmentation. I illustrated that in the previous slide. There's lots of problems associated with scaling issues, both in terms of space and time and various forms of organization and governance. Um, uncertainty and change are really difficult for governance to grapple with. And also there's, there's major issues to do with the capacity and the awareness of our management agencies about what's going on in the world around them. Next slide, please, Conrad. So Rebecca has done a really great job of introducing some of these um, up-to-date cutting edge issues in ecological science associated with tipping points and context dependency and ecological networks and so on. All of that science, I think, opens up opportunities in terms of the way that we think about managing within an EBM framework. It shifts us away from thinking about business as usual and all of the path dependencies that go with that. It shifts us towards thinking about inclusive and forward-looking policy development, it makes us think about the relevance of the policy to the ecosystem response. It provides a framework for community engagement there's clear alignment with Mataranga and Kaitiaki Tanga, as Megan talked about. It makes management focus on actions and it really supports the development of our blue economy. And all of those actions then feed back on the impact that the research is having. So that's a win-win scenario for all of us. Next slide, please, Conrad. These kinds of um, research activities support the implementation of marine spatial planning activities. We've been reviewing the um, tools that are available for cumulative effects assessments. And it became clear to us that really, there aren't those that are fit for our purpose because a lot of them focus on the cumulative effects being driven by interactions between stresses. So they don't really deal with these ecosystems as networks where the stresses are propagated within those networks. And that limits the capacity to really understand how ecosystems will change. So that has important implications for how we set up marine spatial planning activities. And essentially these are maps of different layers of activities laid out with maps of different considerations of the, the habitats or other kind of ecological variables. With each of those layers of activities, there are multiple stresses associated with each that all have different um, durations and effects. And again, with the habitat layers, we need to be thinking about whether they're really the right ones in terms of understanding what the threats to the ecosystems might be. Next slide, please, Conrad. The other area that we're um, playing into heavily is, is thinking about limit setting and the way that we avoid risk in the environment. We use limits an awful lot in terms of environmental management, whether it's limits on the loads of contaminants that can go into a place or limits on the um, quantities um, that can be extracted from places. We tend to do these limit setting processes in isolation and we it tends to be a, a uh, one stress at a time problem. 
And it tends to be a set and forget policy too. So once we've set the limit, job done. Um, we need to move to managing cumulative effects, thinking more about using this knowledge of ecosystem processes. Our research is clearly showing that national guidelines are insensitive to cumulative effects. It's showing that these one size fits all measures are unlikely to protect us against tipping points. It's also highlighting that meaningful action is desperately needed to advance integrative management because the windows of opportunity to affect change and maintain critical ecosystem services and biodiversity are closing next slide please Conrad. so that really moves us into a space where we we're not really trying to manage the decline but we're trying to restore ecosystems that does involve reducing threats, but it also involves restoration of various forms. And that's pretty important if we're going to um, address the trifecta of global environmental crises of biodiversity loss, climate change and ecological sustainability. Next slide, please, Conrad. So one of the things we've been able to do by going back and thinking about um, what we understand about disturbance recovery dynamics in ecosystems has come up with simple decision support tools that allow people to work through what their options might be in terms of doing various positive actions in various places and where things are likely to work, where things may need a helping hand and where things may be um, the expectation is that we're, we're not gonna fix this fast. Next slide, please. We can simplify the detail of the um, information presented in the last slide down and abstract it and provide some quite simple frameworks for thinking about how we deal with changes in the ecosystem response time or the duration over which we expect stressors or combination stresses to act. And, and the spatial extent over which um, those particular activities have a, have a footprint. And, it, and as we move through the space, we can think about what the risks are and then what our potential to improve our management of resilience and recovery are, moving from simply monitoring for future change to um, turning off the taps and, and giving the system a break and letting it recover into spaces of, of the need for active intervention. Next slide, please, Conrad. And we can open up that a little bit further by thinking about how these environmental footprints, both in terms of their spatial extent and you know, how hard we stamp in the sand, if you like, is affecting systems from the open coast through to more enclosed um, and isolated systems within estuaries and thinking about how different kinds of ecological processes affect recovery rates um, and whether they happen to be slow processes and fast processes. And notice here, we're talking about ecological processes. We're not really talking about how long it takes a fish to grow or how long it takes a kelp to, to grow because often the rates of recovery that we would predict based on those kind of demographic factors don't really match what we observe in the real world. Next slide, please, Conrad. So my last slide is really to um, make a plea to not ignore empirical ecology here. Um, we've been able to demonstrate that we can examine these networks in, in feasible ways that are really helping us understand what's going on and they're helping us to understand simultaneously multiple processes. Cumulative effects really inhabit a world of indirect effects and the propagation of effects across networks, um, leading to the unintended consequences that Conrad alluded to at the beginning of the talk. Um, Long-term observation of natural ecosystems is therefore important. We don't have good monitoring of our marine environment. We do need to make sure we're measuring the right things, of course, and that's a non-trivial task, um, but that's an important start to what we're doing. And it's an important element of checking on 
how we're going and how we're succeeding because we have to succeed. The real world examples that we generate from this research are really important in helping reduce uncertainty and focus management actions. And they provide real world examples that help bring people along on this journey. Thanks, Conrad. That's it from me. Thanks, Simon. Um, handing over to Joe. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Joanne Ellis. I co-lead the Risk and Uncertainty Project, and today I'm going to be talking about linking the consequences of cumulative effects that we've been learning about in this webinar into risk assessment frameworks. Next slide, please. So central to decision making within an EBM context is the need for methods and frameworks that can assess uh, risk as well as associated uncertainties in the marine environment that arise from these cumulative effects that we've been learning about. So within the risk and uncertainty project, we've been evaluating some of the methods that are presently available and used in Aotearoa New Zealand, as well as um, what's used internationally for supporting EBM as well as the needs and aspirations of Māori. And these have include looking at simple generalised likelihood consequence methods through to more flexible Bayesian network methods. And what we've found based on this review is that uh, with the exception of Bayesian network models, most of these presently used risk assessment frameworks are actually not fit for purpose for EBM. Next slide, please. Um, and so we've identified a set of criteria that we believe uh, risk assessment approaches need to be need to meet to be fit for purpose for marine EBM. And these includes aspects such as whether or not the assessment consider multiple ecosystem components, whether it can include uh, other aspects beyond biophysical components such as social, cultural and economic values. And um, we've learnt in the previous presentations about the importance of considering interactions, feedbacks and indirect effects and so on. So can the risk assessment uh, evaluate these components as well as threshold responses? And further, can the risk assessments produce spatial outputs or estimates of uncertainty and so on? Next slide, please. So Simon has presented on the importance of managing for ecosystem resilience and recovery. And as, as noted, um, when we looked at this review of risk assessment methods that are currently available and being used, most of them are not fit for purpose in an EBM context. And so in collaboration with theme one, we've been investig investigating the application of principles-based approaches based on the ecological theory that has been developed in theme one. So our understanding of the ecology. And you can see in the middle slide that as the spatial extent, extent and footprint increases, the risk of an ecological shift increases. But on the, on the right hand panel, you can see that actually as we move from a healthy system and we start approaching a tipping point, the uncertainty as we move over to a potential degraded state actually increases as we're approaching tipping points. And Rebecca also outlined very nicely that it is very difficult to predict these tipping points. Next slide, please. So based on our understanding of the ecology, uh, we've been developing some risk-based principles that relate to the risk of losing biodiversity or the risk of uh, losing, say, ecosystem function. And this is based on a lot of the research that's been done in the Cumulative Effects Project uh, to date. And these principles relate to these fast and slow processes that you've heard about. Um, for example, you can see the top six principles relate to the state of the ecosystem with respect to the ecology. So what is the degree of loss of components that would regulate ecosystem resilience? Um, is there a degree of loss of slow to regenerate components? These are your large important macrofauna that drive many of the important processes in the system. Um, the likelihood of non-additive responses, the degree of loss of primary producers, structuring macrofauna or organisms that change nutrient cycles that are central to feedbacks, um, slinks into some of those network diagram research that has been highlighted. 
And then we also have some principles at the bottom that relate to the stresses. Um, so for example, are the, is there the presence of multiple stresses in the system, which is obviously going to increase the risk of thresholds and non-additive responses? Uh, are the stresses accumulating or ongoing in the system? And is there a, a likelihood of physical legacies, for example, from nutrients that remain in the sediments? So next slide, please. So if we take these uh, risk principle framework and apply it to two case studies, we'll work through some of these ideas. So in scenario A here, we have, um, sorry, we have the Whangatiao Harbour, and we can see in the Whangatiao Harbour that we have many, sorry, I'm just having problems with my screen. Uh, we have, Sorry, we can see in the Whangatia Harbour that we have um, limited amounts of stresses in the system, but the stresses still have a, a large amount of the shellfish that structure the system. So we can see that if we look at the health here, because of the presence of the large macrofauna and dominant structuring organisms, that with respect to our risk principles, we would still have a healthy system in terms of there being low risk. Um, the losses in the shellfish species and the buildup of legacy in the sediments have not yet occurred. So, um, but there is the potential for these stresses uh, to, to remain. And in other places, they may have legacy impact. So we may have some higher risk in terms of the stresses. Next slide, please, Conrad. And here we have the Manukau estuary, which has received decades of accumulation of mud, heavy metals and nutrients. So in some places, the shellfish species have been lost or the abundances may have been diminished. Um, while in other places, there may still be good areas or abundances of shellfish, the stress regimes are predicted to continue to accumulate and there can be potential legacies of sediments and nutrients in the system. So here, based on the ecological principles, we may risk, rank the risk as being high for the ecology and similarly high for the stresses. Next slide, please, Conrad. So if we think about that slide that I showed where we saw uncertainty um, increasing as we were approaching the potential to move from a healthy to a degraded system, and the importance of management actions, it's actually in those places where we're really uncertain that we need to think about the importance of management actions and delays and decision making. So if we consider our two case studies, we have the estuary A, the Whangatiao, where we have no action to mitigate, um, that what we would likely see is that this could lead to multiple tipping points and degradation through time. For our scenario B, Estuary Manukau, the ecosystem begins at a low ecosystem function because a tipping point has most likely already occurred. No further action um, to mitigate will result in further tipping points as stresses accumulate. So both scenarios are going to result in decline and end in the same place eventually, but the number of tipping points and the rate of decline will depend on a combination of where the system started from and the stress regimes that they experience. Next slide, please. Um, if we look at a management uh, interaction or intervention of reduce and let recover, for uh, the Whangatia, a reduction of stresses um, is likely to halt further degradation. And because as noted, there weren't legacies, um, improvement should, should occur. Whereas scenario B, reduce and let recover um, will prevent further tipping points, but we're unlikely to see any improvement because of the ecosystem state, the ecological and stressor legacies. So reduce and let recover prevents further degradation, but it'll only result in improvement in systems where legacy impacts are not blocking that recovery. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, did we, yeah, active, active intervention and restoration. So here we have a potential for active intervention uh, where we could look at reseeding of shellfish along with stress of reduction. 
which is likely in the Whangatiao to build resilience against further perturbations. In the Manukau, we can see restoration of shell fish beds and reduction um, is less likely to improve because of these legacies. So active restoration is needed to drive improvement in the situation uh, where legacies have blocked recovery, but that recovery will be slower and uncertainty higher in areas that were degraded to begin with. Uh, so in summary, last slide please, um, risk assessments really need to move beyond an evaluation of the direct impacts of a single stressor on a species or a habitat. Um, we've proposed that approaches that meet our criteria, including the recognition of ecological complexity, have the greatest, uh, underpinned by ecological theory, have the greatest uh, potential to support decision making in an EBM context, and also highlight the importance of consideration of uh, management actions, either delays or active interventions such as restoration efforts, uh, should be considered particularly when a system is moving from a healthy state towards a, a degraded state uh, where the uncertainty is the highest or the greatest. Kia ora, thank you, Conrad. Kia ora, Joe, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Um, over to you, Tom, for our final talk. Kia ora, Conrad. Kia ora, koutou katoa, ko Tom Bro tēnei, ko Taihoru Nukurangi e te mahi ana. Uh, today, um, I'm really excited to present some research um, on behalf of our uh, wider team within Project 1.2, uh, Spatially Explicit Cumulative Effects Tools. Um, and this is uh, an example of a, a particular tool that um, can integrate some of, this, uh, some of this information on cumulative effects in, within a spatial context to um, allow for uh, more accurate decision making in, in the marine space. Uh, next slide, please. So just a really quick overview um, of uh, spatial planning tools. Um, so these are regularly used uh, throughout the Motu and internationally to prioritize uh, the seascape um, for protection or restoration based on um, preconceived uh, scenarios uh, from the stakeholders involved. Um, the key uh, inputs for these tools um, and, and uh, a regular one that we use here in Aotearoa is zonation. The key inputs are often these uh, outputs from predictive models, so uh, species distribution models that uh, show the uh, predicted distribution of uh, the value um, of a particular species or taxa or habitat. So those are shown there on the left. Um, and these inputs can also incorporate uh, information on diversity, information on important um, functional groups. Uh, so those are groups of taxa that have important roles in ecosystems, but they can also in include um, important spatial layers that relate to value across different uh, cultural or uh, industry um, uh, areas. So these inputs are then combined within um, a prioritization model that generates an output like that seen in the center here. And basically what this shows is uh, the most efficient locations shown in the bright colors um, for, the, uh, for the spatial um, representation of the scenario that, that has been defined. So for example, imagine if, um, if uh, a stakeholder group wants to uh, recover or protect uh, 90 or 80% of the distribution um, of a range of taxa, that uh, target can be met by um, applying a threshold to the prioritization that then, then might lead to um, some candidate management areas like uh, those that are shown on, on the right there. Uh, next slide, please, Conrad. Um, so this is a really valuable tool, um, but obviously it's really important to uh, account for um, the the uh, condition of the underlying um, habitat. So we know that um, species are. Um, sorry, Conrad. I think I can see your uh, your folder there. Yeah, thank you. So we know that habitat um, condition is a really important factor in prioritizing, uh, prioritizing areas for, uh, for recovery. So the outputs of these distribution uh, models um, provide us a good representation of areas that are highly suitable for, um, for particular species or, or habitats. But often we don't account for the fact that that habitat has experienced um, 
past degradation across um, you know, potentially a, a range of stresses. And so um, we need to account for that information and that's typically done within um, decision support tools by uh, applying what's called a condition layer. But currently those condition layers are applied um, to represent only a single um, stressor and uh, their impact on uh, where we see the remaining value, the remaining distribution of a, of a taxa given that impact uh, can be quite strong. But we obviously need to, uh, to account for multiple stresses if they're a realistic um, uh, determination of, of where uh, the current uh, distribution of, of biodiversity is. Uh, next slide, please. So this has led to um, the development of methods within uh, project 1.2 to really build on um, some of the great information that's coming through phase one of the challenge and um, some, of the, some of the ecological interaction networks that uh, Rebecca nicely uh, discussed um, earlier. So uh, our method basically allows for the incorporation of stresses as descriptors of, uh, of the distribution of, of biodiversity. So we know that habitat um, characteristics are really important at shaping distribution, but obviously so are the footprints of stresses. Um, so by building these into the species distribution models or the taxa distribution models, we really capture that, um, that uh, spatial interaction between environmental variables and stresses. Um, we also refer back to some of these interaction frameworks by allowing these stresses to interact in ways that are underpinned by ecological observations. So um, these can range from, uh, from options including no interactions, additive interactions, or multiplicative interactions like that is shown in the in the plot here. So this is just a sort of a simulated example of the relationship between sedimentation and fishing on uh, the effects uh, on uh, habitat condition for a particular um, habitat forming benthic invertebrate species. So we can see that when those two stresses are um, at, at high levels, they interact to have a strong negative influence on the condition of the underlying habitat shown there in uh, red colors. And when these two are at low values, they have a positive impact on the uh, distribution or abundance of that taxa. And we can also construct these models for functional groups, which um, really allow for the transferability um, of these uh, habitat condition layers among taxa with uh, similar ecology and, and vulnerability to these stresses. So things that um, have similar um, ecological uh, functional traits, um, it may be relevant to apply these um, stressor layers across several uh, different, uh, different groups of taxa. Next slide, please. So within um, project 1.2, uh, we are applying these, uh, these methods in uh, several case studies. We have a sort of a national broad scale case study um, that centers on the, the Chatham Rise area. Um, we have a regional case study based at the Hawke's Bay, which is um, really around developing a, a framework to, um, to guide the uh, integration of, uh, of these methods using spatial decision support tools within a regional um, spatial planning process. And then we also have a, a Rohi Moana uh, local case study um, at uh, Ohiwa Estuary um, that was introduced really nicely by Megan earlier. So exploring those, uh, those stressor interactions between um, uh, uh, starfish and uh, muscle uh, recovery. And so for the national uh, case study, essentially we're, uh, we're trying to prioritize the seascape um, for uh, the protection and restoration of benthic invertebrate communities that provide important functional roles in the structuring of the ecosystem. So for example, those that may provide um, three-dimensional uh, biogenic habitat structure that um, provide really important um, functional uh, stability to the system. Now, it's really important to, um, to, to include uh, this kind of information within spatial prioritizations, but ultimately we require a really, um, really detailed amount of information to be able to perform these prioritizations. And I'll, I'll touch on that again in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the outputs, um, there's a range of outputs that are generated by these, uh, by these processes, but essentially we get the prioritization of a seascape to guide uh, managers with the best locations to implement some form of management activity. So you can see on the top uh, pane here, we have uh, prioritization. So the, the best locations to achieve a particular management objective shown in, in the red color. And that uh, example has uh, no uh, habitat condition accounted for. The 
middle pane there shows um, the impact of interacting stresses. So that, uh, that interaction uh, plot that was shown on uh, a few slides earlier between uh, fishing and uh, sedimentation. We can see that that really changes the picture in terms of the locations that uh, we need to act to, to uh, protect, uh, protect the remaining uh, distribution of, uh, of benthic invertebrate uh, species. And the bottom pane there essentially shows um, the, the difference between the two. So uh, what that is telling us is the locations that uh, we should focus on where we know that the habitat is highly suitable for the recovery of these, uh, of these uh, species, um, but the stressor levels are such that um, they're really limiting um, the, the expansion of, of those, um, those benthic invertebrate communities. And so if we're thinking about recovery, those are the best locations that uh, we want to aim for. Next slide, please. So this all sounds uh, really good, but um, it's important to, to note that uh, these, uh, these decision support tools um, have several limitations. One of the key ones is that uh, some of the key information uh, is, is often not available. So we, so we really do require good levels of information on the distribution of biodiversity, uh, environmental data to um, describe the, um, the distribution of, of taxa, and critically, good spatially um, explicit uh, footprints for the distribution of some of the key stresses. And we know that those, that information, unfortunately, isn't available in many cases. And ultimately, uh, these, um, these decision support tools are based on the outputs of models. And so there's a whole range of model-based assumptions around whether these models are a realistic representation of, uh, of the, the real world in terms of the distribution of both stresses um, and uh, the ecological uh, features we're interested in. It's also uh, really important to be able to capture some of the fine scale and dynamic processes within uh, that we know exist within uh, within the marine realm. Um, and currently, these uh, these approaches um, are really just representing a, a static uh, a static uh, solution. Though we are working on on methods to to refine this. But ultimately, um, we know that this uh, this method provides a spatial solution only. So it's telling us the best places that we need to act. Um, it's not necessarily telling us what we need to do to achieve recovery. And that's when we come back to uh, some of the nice work presented by Joe and Simon earlier, where we need to be looking at uh, some of these uh, some of these uh, frameworks for uh, active restoration versus um, versus uh, passive monitoring or passive uh, forms of uh, of protection to really get to how you know what we need to do to achieve um, the results for protection in the locations that we deem a high priority. Next slide, please. So just in, in summary, summary now, um, so we've developed these new methods that can incorporate cumulative effects into these decision support tools. Um, and we're also working on uh, methods to incorporate Matauranga Māori um, as a valuable knowledge system that describes the distribution of both uh, biodiversity and stresses, and working on ways to uh, refine um, estimates of ecosystem capacity uh, within a spatial context. Ultimately, this is another tool um, in the kite that uh, will be really suited to the needs of some users, but, but not others for the reasons um, I just spoke about. Um, and ultimately, we um, require really high data uh, at the appropriate scales um, to be able to refine and use these methods. Um, and they, there is a uh, often a substantial input from stakeholders in these, these processes um, due to the, the sort of iterative um, nature to suit the needs of uh, different, uh, different parties. Um, so namahi nui, and uh, that's me. Thank you, Tom. Um, thank you, uh, all of our speakers, um, for a great set of interrelated talks. Hopefully, they'll stimulate um, lots of questions uh, in the Q&A session. So now we're going to move into a sort of panel discussion. Um, and I'd like to introduce our panelists. And um, then we can start, uh, people in the, in the Zoom can start adding questions into the, the question and answer box. And we'll, I'll send them to the, to the various panelists as we go along. So if I could just ask the panelists maybe to put their cameras on, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen in a, in a couple of minutes after I've introduced everybody. Um, so on our, on our panel today, we're really lucky to have 
twisted their arms to join us uh, as some of our co-development partners who've been along with us in the challenge now for quite some time. We have um, Ian Shapcock from Te Atiawa, Mana Whenua Ki Te Taiehu Trust um, down in Waikawa and really pleased to see him back in the country. He's been a big supporter of our research um, in the Marble Sounds now for, for a little while. Um, Megan Carbines, uh, who we've worked with for a long period of time, Principal Environmental Scientist at Auckland Council. And then from central government, we have um, Ian Tuck, who was with NEWA, but now more recently, fisheries scientist with NZ Fisheries at MPI. And we've also uh, managed to rope in um, some of our sustainable seas researchers um, as, as well. And these, these people that we've got listed here will be able to speak to the specifics of any of the information in the talk as well. So we have Kura Paul Bork at, um, here at the University of Waikato. She leads um, T1 Afimai Afiatu and also is co-lead of degradation and recovery with Simon Thrush. Um, Carolyn Lindquist, Uni University of Auckland, Niwa. Um, she's leading 1.2, the project Tom was just speaking about. And Judy Hewitt, who sits on the challenge leadership team alongside me, theme leader for risk and uncertainty, but also a key researcher in projects and degradation and recovery and risk and uncertainty as well. So I'll stop sharing my screen. So hopefully we can um, see everybody and um, we'll begin uh, opening this up uh, to the panel, I'll just make my screen bigger so I can see everybody. I can open the question and answers um, boxes. Um, so I guess um, there's some long questions in here from, ha from Hamish Rennie and I'll just work through these, um, through these in a second, but maybe we could just start off with a general question to some of our panel members. I'm gonna focus on our co-development partners here um, because it's important that they have a voice. So Ian Chapcock, perhaps maybe we can start with you. And just give us an overview from your perspective um, of what degradation and importantly, what recovery of the Moana would look like for you. How, um, can you hear me? Can all hear me? Yes, Kira, okay. Uh, Kira Toto. Um, good to share this with you and, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to be on the panel. It's appreciated. And also uh, thanks for Linda for the karakia, the opening. And also thanks to the speakers for um, sharing their scientific findings and perspectives. Um, very worth att worthwhile attending, so I'm pleased to be here. Um, and, and as I say that, I step out of that and say, uh, first of all, we can't recover. And, and that has to be in our heads. We can restore, and, and Judy will understand how important language is for people to understand the reality of this. Simon came on board and spoke my words for me, which was, we can restore. If we, if we think about recovering, and we think about science and Mataranga alone, uh, we won't go anywhere. And so my, my um, value of, of the association here with uh, academia is that we can't paddle this waka well on our own. We have to um, synthesize the Mataranga and the academic world of science. And so that gives us the ability to paddle. And then the direction is, is the issue. And we can paddle in a direction that we find a lot more out and we have notions about what needs to be done and I put myself back to the sound science who was held at the Waikawa Marae in 1987. There was a massive assemblage of scientists from around the country there and I stepped back off that anticipating change and the change that happened was actually negative because science is happening in parallel to a failed culture and until the culture is shifted the opportunities to apply the knowledge that's being developed in your tertiary institutions will be hamstrung to the point that we won't make the necessary recovery gains to sustain ourselves. And so that's that's the position as I see it. I've been in the environmental management strategic planning game for 45 years and I, I'm 75 coming up. So I've got an observ observational experiential view of the world of 70 years and I've observed degradation. The second presenter popped up a slide that showed us all, all roads lead to human behaviour. And so what I'm asking uh, the assembled multitude is here is there's an elephant in the room and that's the Kotawai of the crown lying over the human behaviour of Aotearoa. So, so co-management has never been more important. Matananga has never been more important. The gift of for, for the from the Indigenous people to reacquaint uh, the community, the culture has never been more important. And the science isn't going to do that. The hard science is not going to do that. What I wanted to see here was another half dozen social scientists 
who were au fait with, and uh, <laughs> don't get me going, Conrad. Uh, so I wanted to see another half dozen social scientists here that were supporting the scientists that were taking us out to help shift the culture in the community so they would be receptive to the knowledge that's generated in the academic institutions. That's the elephant in the room here. And until we get that elephant some chaff, we're gonna be, we're gonna be running up and down on the spot. And so that's, as I see it, I've never seen any improvement here. In the 47 years, I've had my nose on the glass in the Rohi here. Back to you, thank you. George Jaffe, thanks for your perspective. Really appreciate that. Um, Megan, I might just throw a question at you if I can, um, as uh, you know, working in uh, New Zealand's largest urban centre. So from your perspective, working in regional councils over the years, what's, what do you consider to be the greatest challenge or challenges in, in managing cumulative effects um, in, in the Auckland region? Um, yeah, kia ora. Um, I think it follows on from what Ian's just talked about, that I think our greatest challenge is, is having that kind of shared values and objectives and that we're working towards the same, same thing um, and that the environment sits at the core of that. Uh, we see that coming through a little bit with um, Te Manoa Te Wai or Te Manoa Te Taio, but then we have competing policies um, through the urban development policy that, you know, conflict with that. And so, you know, as a management agency, we're often faced with kind of dealing with the thing that's right in front of us and um, those kind of conflicting voices prevent you from stepping back and really managing as a whole and managing for a, for a systems outcome. So I think, it, you know, some conversation at a national level around that sets the, you know, what we want going forward for the environment as well as the economy and all those other things. But at the moment, that's kind of drowned out by the most immediate issue, which actually, if we step back, is probably the environment, but it's not sitting up there at the top. Kira Megan, thanks for that. Great. Um, Ian, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Um, and I'll probably follow this up with Carolyn shortly after with a similar question. And it's around where you think um, marine spatial planning. I know New Zealand fisheries have, have been doing a lot of work in this space. Um, where do you see that uh, within a cumulative effects management? And Tom talked about some of the limitations and also some of the attributes of that. From, from your perspective now in, in, re, in, in central government, um, how useful is it? What needs to be, how could it be improved in, um, in, in your area? Well, I think it's very useful. I mean, as as sort of you've alluded to, we're already using it. We have um, we have two uh, processes underway right now, or probably more than two actually. But in um, both fisheries outside the EZ, um, within the EZ in deep water, and specifically in the Haraki Gulf, we're using very similar sort of zonation based tools to look at um, spatial overlap of fishing with with other with other sort of um, habitat values but I, I wasn't actually familiar with the 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 multi-stressor um, approaches is it me or we've just lost Ian just lost Ian Carolyn maybe you could um <laughs> answer that question on Ian's behalf. Wait, wait, we can potentially guess where it was going to go. Oh, he's back. <laughs> you're back. Ian, do you want to continue? Oh yeah, how far did I get? <laughs> um, about, you were just talking about Tom's stuff on the uh, integration of stresses and that's about where you got uh, to. Uh, I well, I, I said some really clever stuff after that. You've missed I'm all sure. That. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, basically, yeah, the, the, those additional stresses and um, yeah, understanding the interactions of those and being able to incorporate those in in that sort of process. Oh, now we've lost them gone completely. all together. So I, I may follow up. But Thank yeah, you, so with, with marine spatial planning, the you know, historically marine spatial planning was just looking at overlap of many different layers at the same time, but not really looking at how different stressors interacted. And so really it's marine spatial planning moving toward how can we consider the system as a whole, how many different stressors we can put in there. And, um, you know, there are a lot of great things going on. So um, Ian mentioned one of the projects they're funding in the Haraki Gulf is trying to then look at, you know, where are places where we can look at recovery or rest restoration potential. Um, I know in our world, we're very good at actually having, I would call it stressor layers for some stressors, particularly those that are industry related, but we do struggle to get uh, footprints of understanding. Um, in Joe's talk, she would have 
um, had things on sediments in there and Tom as well. So, you know, where are the sediments? What is the history of where the sediments have landed? What are the impacts of sediments on different components of the ecosystem? And, you know, how do we pull out what are the key things that we need to be bringing into marine spatial planning context of what those stressors are and how do they interact with other things? So uh, heaps of work to do, but lots of great progress recently. Sure, Carolyn, thanks very much for that. Kura, I'm going to um, call on you, um, if I may, to answer one of Hamish Rennie's many questions um, about the Ohiwa work. And um, I'm going to paraphrase Hamish, and I'm sure he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but he's interested in um, how transferable and generalizable perhaps some of the work is, and also, you know, how you go about documenting and whether, and I know the answer to this because I've been involved with Megan's project, uh, documenting the mahi and a lot of the work and learnings from the journey. Um, kia ora Koto. Um, yes, the work in Ohiwa Harbour is replica, you can replicate it and it is actually uh, to varying degrees being replicated uh, in different locations, different estuaries around the country. Um, the second part of the question, I think, Conrad, was that talking? So could you repeat the second part? Um, I guess it's uh, have been his question is around have you been recording the cost of carrying out this work so you can provide the information to government and Megan alluded to this in her talk about the unrecognized I'm not going to use the word burden because that's not a burden but the unrecognized mahi involved with the discussions and the co-development process and you know it's critically important to move the move the work forward but how do you make that a part of how you do it and have um, it recognised. Yes, spot on. Um, so Hamish, in a non-monetary term, um, I guess the cost, if you like, um, for co-development and co-implementation is what Conrad was just alluding to around the engagement, for lack of a better word. So the project in Ohiwa works um, intimately with councils, iwi, community, um, iwi leaders, as well as uh, scientists, marine scientists and ecologists. Um, so, and we have been documenting uh, all our meetings, our engagement, and it's a long, long Excel list. But uh, so at the end of the project, because there are multiple moving parts, uh, we will be bringing all of that together to look at that uh, in terms of, um, and I guess, uh, I think you said burden, Conrad, and in some ways it is, but if you're going to plan research, all you have to do is factor in the time and effort required into the research design. So uh, it's totally doable, but it is super consuming. Uh, another, another factor also is the training up of the next generation. If you do anything with Māori, with iwi and our oceans, it will always require um, succession or access for youth, access to mātauranga Māori as well as marine science together. So that also is a factor. Kilda. Sure. Good. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to post this question to Judy and she'll know exactly why I've posted it to her. Um, this is from, uh, from Hamish and in respect to Simon's presentation, um, Hamish is asking um, with the RMA uh, revisions and with their focus on limit setting and activity based planning is totally the wrong direction. Is this the advice the challenge will give to government based on Simon's clear statements about limit setting? And the answer to that, Hamish, is yes. That is exactly the advice that we will be giving. And actually, it will be of no surprise to most of the people that we work with, including Megan, that that's the sort of, that's the sort of advice that we will be given. Um, I think that kind of, the, you really need, to, when you're managing something, you need to be managing where you're managing. You need to be thinking about that. You need to be thinking about it, not just in terms of the fact that the ecology is location specific and the, the stresses are location specific and the way they interact are location specific, but also that what the people actually want from the environment and their connection to the environment is also lo location specific. So all of those things really mean that um, you may have a national process for how you go about doing these things, but you need to be looking for local solutions. And that is basically what, what we'll be saying. And I can see Kura nodding her head. <laughs> and um, that um, document is being worked through, through at the moment. So hopefully that'll, that'll be released soon. Um, Judy, I've got another question. I'll start with you, but then um, maybe Megan and, and Carolyn and others would like to 
contribute to this as well. And it's a tricky question, another tricky question from Hamish. Can't wait till his webinar comes up. Um, and it's around the tipping points that, uh, and you know, he's asking the question basically, if you can't predict it, if you don't have a limit, then you know how useful is that say an environment court and i've got an answer to that but maybe um judy you might like to start with that um that situation that that question i guess there's a number of of answers to that um one of them is that it's not just scientists and managers that need to learn how to change their thinking lawyers may need to do a little bit of that as well and actually get a bit more into the real world. Uh, but the other thing is that the, um, the location specificity gives a lot of advantages. And we can't necessarily predict when a tipping point is going to occur in a particular estuary based on national data. But what we can do is given the information about the, the, that particular, say in this case, an estuary, um, the stresses that are going on, how people are using it, what's actually happening in it, what's been happening in it in the past, we can make a damn good idea about the types of interactions between stresses that are going to go on, the sorts of responses you'll see, whether or not something is, is there that will actually be able to respond to removal of degradation or whether or not you actually have to go out there and give it a bit of a help. Um, we can do those things. So we might not be able to do that at a national level, but we can, and we are getting pretty good at being able to think about how you could do that in a particular situation with the aims that the, the local communities are wanting. So kind of like putting together that mataranga, that ecological know-how, and the, the kind of the, the, the local information and melding those together and using it to get the best results that we can possibly get for the environment, I think is, is basically kind of like certainly where I'm at. Thanks, Judy. Megan, do you have any perspectives on this? I know you've been through a number of environment court settings and, and um, using evidence from scientists that may be contradictory um, to you know, contradicting each other basically. So, how have, have you? What have your learnings from that, perhaps, and your perspectives on it? Um, yeah. So, I was I was reading through Hamish's questions as they came up and kind of reached his final point around you know that is one of the issues with our effects based legislation um, that we often end up arguing about the very narrow effects of particular stresses. Um, but I have seen cases, and I think the capacity is there to. And it depends on the information that is brought to the court in terms of, as Judy's just outlined, we do have these understandings. And if you bring that up against quite a narrow perspective of that this is the effect and the limit and how we're going to control it, that larger picture can actually be more um, uh, um, informative and more palatable to the court that actually, uh, you know, taking a holistic approach that brings in the community's views and the, and the full extent of our knowledge and talks about things like um, you know, potential effects and uncertainties is, is a, um, a stronger argument than what we might have traditionally seen, which is you know, an argument about whether a limit is here or there based on two scientists' interpretations. So I think the potential is there, um, but it is about um, the information that's brought to the court, the case that's brought by the agencies or the, um, whoever is in the court about taking those, you know, that bigger perspective and, and thinking about what we actually want to achieve rather than what we want to limit. Thanks, Megan. Um, that's great. I'm not sure really who to fire this question at. So if someone wants to have a go at answering it, you can just dive straight in. This is from um, Catherine, and, and thank you for the, for the comment, Catherine, uh, around the webinar. Much appreciated. Her question is, how close are we as a nation to having sufficient information systems to be able to do a national marine restoration feasibility analysis and you know what what interventions do we need to close that gap so instead of i know we have monitoring programs to set up to look at the state of the marine environment and they've been looking at the decline pr primarily over the last little while but is there enough knowledge now to do an inventory of what's needed for restoration carolyn maybe you could start Sure. Um, 
I, I would say we've probably made a lot more progress in the last five years at bringing a lot of data sets together. And this is, you know, at the national level, really something that's been led by, you know, a group looking at marine spatial planning that's uh, central government, Department of Conservation, Fisheries New Zealand, Ministry for the Environment. And that's actually funded bringing a lot of data data sets together, whether it's point records or creating models, but looking at what are all the key ecological information that we need and what do we have, but also at the same time identifying gaps. So where, what types of ecological data are we actually missing these comprehensive layers? For example, a key one would be biogenic habitats. What do we know about biogenic habitats? Well, we all know pretty much what they are, what we think are important, how they're sensitive to different stressors, but we often have very little information other than a spattering of point records on where they are. So there's been a lot of progress and also in increasing accessibility. So the Department of Conservation now has this big geodata portal where you can actually access a large number of these layers already, and then they're working on uh, moving that forward. And I know NIWA is doing the same at making accessible point records from a lot of the big NIWA invertebrate data collections. So lots on accessibility, but then um, how do we actually move forward on what's available and what we need? And here the councils are at the same time doing a lot of bringing together all these local rather than national data sets, but oftentimes finding that there are more gaps and potentially that, that one might be a good one for Megan to follow up. But you know, how do we then fill those gaps so that we actually have up-to-date information that we can use for looking at recovery and restoration? One sentence, Conrad, and I want to say, who's looking, who's doing the gap analysis on Makaranga? Okay, thank you. Um, bit me to it, um, Shafi, well done. Uh, I would just like to also add that it's about also making um, for uh, wide restoration and recovery to occur, we have to make deliberate space for intergenerational knowledge. Uh, most of the speakers today and the panelists have already alluded to the importance of that, uh, the knowledge of groups of people who have interacted, observed and lived in the same place for many consecutive generations um, to assist meaningful ecological change. Because from, um, from an indigenous or Maparanga Māori perspective, um, recovery or restoration cannot occur from a distance. We have to be connected and actively active within the whole process of humans as part of the world as a species of the world. Um, I, I Judy, guess I'll just comment? add yep. one thing. Um, I'm not entirely sure that a national assessment of restoration um, capability would be necessarily a, a good way to go. Um, continuing on from Kura, what Kura said, I think that the that what people want and how likely they are to be able to get it is very much situation dependent. And I, I would suggest that this sort of work would be best done from a bottom up approach um, with what, what the national thing could do is actually set the framework and the, the availability of funds to actually help fund this sort of stuff. <laughs> Sounds I was just going to say, yeah. sorry, a uh, similar it. thing, Judy, that um, I think it's one thing to gather more information, but I think what was outlined today as well is an approach for moving forward where we do have that um, imperfect knowledge or uncertainty and getting those frameworks right, because we will never have the perfect information, but we need to be making decisions now and moving forward um, in a positive way. So, and maybe that's a way of gathering that information through those frameworks as, you know, making assessments and then building the knowledge in place as we go forward together rather than um, trying to implement something that's right across um, the country and then we get sort of tangled up and trying to come up with perfect layers. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that as well. I'll, I'll stay in the dark because my connection's killing my, uh, my photo, my uh, video's killing my connection, but definitely agree with what Judy said. I think it has to be very, very locally driven and it would be really reliant on local information. So um, so I think that would be the, the way to go. Although, yeah, a national perspective and national support would be very useful. 
as Kura will confirm, local activity with local groups on the ground with local managers brings the local community together and enhances their knowledge and commitment. So it's, it's one um, informal way of the socialization that I was referring to before, but that socialization needs to come from every direction, from the top down, from the bottom, from the sides, because we don't have time to ignore that. And if we just go on scientific in the hard way, uh, you'll be doing it as we disappear. So the social science, the behavioral change thing is actually needing a parallel suite of work to the hard science. So those things can go together. And the social science needs to be in the mix locally too. We need to understand what those interactions mean, how they're best uh, congregated, what's the best outcome, how relationship building should happen rather than just taking samples and going out there and having a look at the state of things. Over. Sheffy, thanks everyone. I'm, I'm conscious of time and um, Erin is, uh, the Heron's asked to pose a really interesting question, which um, it will help me segue. I'm going to ask this to all the panelists as a way of kind of giving everyone an opportunity and I'll call on you individually to answer it because I've got an order in my head um, about who's going to get the last word basically. Um, and, and my question would have been, um, you know, what, what can we do today to build resilience in our oceans? And then Erin as part to that question will be, why do we not do the things? Um, so what do we need to do and what is the barrier? So um, everyone gets a minute or two to talk about that and answer those that, that, that two part question. I think that'll be a really nice way of rounding things out. So um, I'll start with you, Judy, because you're on the top left hand part of my corner of my screen. And you don't want me to have the last word. Okay. <laughs> you can have the first word. <laughs> Um, I've forgotten what the first question was now. All I can remember is Erin is one. <laughs> so, okay, so the first question is, what should we be doing to build resilience in our oceans? I.e., what's, what's the one thing or the two things that we could do now to help build resilience? And then the second part to that is, why aren't we doing it? What, what are the bottlenecks? And in a very short format. Okay, um, building resilience, I, I actually always find a, a, a difficult concept, but I would say um, building diversity. Um, diversity generally confers resilience no matter what you're talking about. And I think here we're talking about building diversity in, in our um, marine environments, letting there be a range of things that, that can happen there and that the species can, can do. Why, why aren't we doing anything? Um, I think that there's a number of problems there. And I think that a lot of the problems actually are, I'm sorry, our institutions and our laws, which have a really strong reluctance to actually change. And in some cases, actually create a mandate that prevents change occurring. Um, so just think about the consented and non-consented things in a, in a regional council. I mean, those can be a really strong barrier. I was told once by a, a Ministry for the Environment person that um, they didn't need to do anything about the marine environment because there wasn't a crisis there. And they only present crises to their, um, to their, to their minister, so. Thanks, Judy. Um, Megan, your perspectives. What can we do to build resilience? What are the bottlenecks to that? Um, so I think following on from what Judy said, my thinking was more around um, uh, people and their connections with, with the Moana and, and how we get people to feel or understand that same sense of crisis around the environment as they might do around housing or um, other sort of more global issues. Um, because at the end of the day, the environment is going to be the same level of crisis. It probably is already, but, it, you know, we've, we sort of overwhelm it with all these other things that we have to deal with. So I think for resilience, I think, is, is building that connection, building those, those stories, that understanding, and going back to local and place-based. Um, I think our legislations can be hamstrung or our institutions, um, but some of the, the rahui that are going in around the Hauraki Gulf show what can be achieved um, and that legislation can back those up rather than coming in trying to find a legislative solution to some of these things. So I think um, building frameworks where we can work with imperfect information, where we can work on risk and where we can work with, with people that are living in the place is um, where we've got to go. Um, 
Sure, thanks, Megan. Carolyn. Uh, thanks, Conrad. Um, yeah, and I, I think just following, I think everybody's saying exactly what I want to say as well. But, um, you know, how do we actually make sure we're also concentrating? You know, I, I know a lot of the times in funding, things go to new exciting stressors. So let's put a whole lot of money on plastics pollution, but then realizing things like plastics pollution or ocean acidification and heaps of studies that are out there on them. But these often come at the expense of things that we know are the primary drivers of what's going on in the ocean, whether it be physical disturbances to the sea floor or sediment impacts. We know there's these are there, and yet we're not actually often doing anything to address them. So, you know, can we kind of move the system so we're addressing the current existing stressors that have been there for certainly 50 years or more and address the impacts of those rather than kind of pushing a lot of our funding to these new potentially emerging stressors that might have an impact, but might not, but are already on top of what we already have. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, Ian, uh, your perspectives on that question. Oh, Which Ian? Uh, sorry, Ian Tuck. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I think we, uh, we need to be managing with an awareness of these cumulative stressors. So, you know, we, at the moment, you know, acknowledge that we we do very you know for the fisheries it's it's single species uh, management um, and and for the other stresses as well they're just considering those one impacts and so managing with an awareness of the implications of those other stresses I think is really important um, and the you know and things like habitat protection habitat restoration are all going to help build resilience. Um, the the things that perhaps are, are limiting our ability to do that are to some extent sort of knowledge on what some of these um, Im implications are, but also the perhaps as was discussed right at the beginning the the lack of common um, common vision across the various uh, regulatory agencies and the fragmentation and you know in both in terms of uh, remit and scale as to how that regulation works so sort of a more joined up management would be uh, a big advantage, I'm sure. sure thanks, Ian. Um, the last two words will go to um, Ian Shapcock and Kura. So Ian, maybe we can start with you first. The first sentence says, all and every change and plan needs to be based on restoration. And so this is an ideological thing. And to apply that, go back to the previous conversation and say, turbocharged partnership activity at every place around Aotearoa. Get get on the ground projects like Kura's involved with, get Matananga and science to interact, grow that tree so that the local community is opened to its reconnection with Tataio by virtue of engaging and working with its treaty partner on the ground. So you end up with the sort of cultural shift we need to drive uh, management and political change, and you end up with projects that you can focus on the on the scientifically desirable low-hanging fruit that's locally. Kira. Thanks, Ian. Kura. Um, I think it's about breaking down outdated practices. And part of those practices, um, and to do that, we need to, we, it's easy to say we need to, but we must prioritize other knowledge systems, like providing space for Mātauranga Māori to contribute in its own right to work with and alongside marine science to enable us all to better understand and care for our seas. Because um, at the end of the day, it's about recognizing, empowering and promoting different knowledge systems and areas of expertise to assist better understanding and management of our world and ourselves into the future. Kia ora. Thanks everybody. Um, Big shout out to all our panelists. Thanks for handling those questions um, from the floor and from me. Um, also to our speakers who um, gave excellent talks, I thought. And I'd just like to um, call on Linda again, um, if she wouldn't mind, just to close this out. Kia ora, everybody. Kia ora, Conrad. Kia ora, kata katoa. Um, yes, just supporting Conrad's thanks to you all, the panelists, and to the awesomely insightful questions to come from the virtual floor as well. Um, fantastic webinar this morning, so kia ora. <clears throat> uh, tū tawa mai ronga, tū tawa mai raro, tū tawa mai roto, tū tawa mai wao. Kia tawa te mauri tū, te mauri ora, kia ki te katoa, aumie, uie, taikie. <laughs>
Kia ora, everybody.